Welcome back to another episode of The Bourbon Lens. This is Jake along with Scott, and today we are headed out west to see one of our good friends, Bruce Joseph from Hodling & Co., who is the master distiller there, to talk about some exciting changes with one of their brands, Old Potrero, and their update that they have going on. So, Bruce, welcome back to The Bourbon Lens. Thanks for having me back. Well, yeah, I mean, like anytime we get a, a friend to, to reach out and say, hey, we're, uh, we're doing something new, Scott and I always kind of uh, jump up and raise our hand because it piques our interest. And especially because 100% malted rye whiskey, you can't find it many places. So you might as well raise your hand when you can get it. Well, we're, we're here and we're happy with these changes we've made. So um, we'd like everyone to try it. Yeah. So the last time we talked, uh, according to Scott, who uh, fact checked us before the episode, <laughs> was episode 74. Uh, so that was mid 2020. We're, we're approaching episode 200 uh, at this clip right now. So Bruce, it, a lot has happened, right? A pandemic started. A pandemic has kind of ended. I don't know. Kind of. I say kind of. Uh, because there's always, Kinda, a, yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> there's always a new something going on and we, we crowned a new president and all that fun stuff in, in that time. But, you know, one of the things you all did was matured your whiskey a little bit more. So can you just talk about what's going on with, uh, this brand in particular, old Petrero? Well, we, we, um, had wanted to do a re redesign of packaging and also around that about probably four or five years ago, because it was kind of the first time we kind of dipped our toe into the the single barrel thing. And, um, you know, we did some barrel finishes and then a little longer aging for some single barrels. And, you know, in doing that, we were kind of interested in um, and and happy with the flavor of, of the Old Petrero straight rye at six years. And as we um, kind of, you know, backed off on on bottling during this uh, package redesign um, and kind of relaunching the brand with the new packaging. We also took that opportunity to um, switch from a four and a half year old whiskey for our regular straight rye whiskey and increase that to um, a six year old. So the, the new age statement for the straight rye whiskey that's being re-released is um, six years old now. So, you know, what's really interesting is um, there's not many people that come out at a hundred at percent, you know, rye as a, as a straight rye whiskey, right? Uh, the only other one we were talking about them beforehand are another good friend of ours at Frey Ranch in, in Fallon, Nevada. They do a hundred percent straight rye non-malted. You all are a hundred percent, you know, straight rye malted. And so with that, um, like kind of uptick in, in rye whiskey, you know, what's it like to be a differentiated product out there? Like to get people to acclimate in is, is there a big pickup um, for people that are trying to explore whiskey, explore whiskey going for that hundred percent malted rye? Or is it, do you find it hard to educate, educate the consumer? You know, I think it does take some education because um, you know, it doesn't taste. Old Petrero's character is different, is different um, than, maybe, you know, the standard grain bills for rye whiskey. And, and, you know, there's other things that play into it too. You know, when we first came out, you know, our first, uh, release was in, um, January of 96. And at that time, not only were we a hundred percent malted rye, which was a pretty big departure for any rye whiskeys that were out on the market. Um, but we were also pot distilled. Um, so, you know, there, there are a lot of, a lot of things going on and, and it, it had a different character than, um, mm. I think any rye drinkers at that time were used to, and still a lot of rye drinkers now are, are used to it. It, it, it is somewhat unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so speaking of that first, uh, uh, rye whiskey, I was eating my Wheaties or, uh, Fruit Loops or Frosted Flakes in front of the TV watching Power Rangers around circa 1996 on Saturday mornings. Um, so that just talks about the, uh, the maturity of this brand, um, and the maturity of myself because I no longer sit in front of a TV and watch Power Rangers and eat oh, a bowl of cereal. Yes, you do. <laughs> I mean, if it was, if the original Power Rangers was on, I'd probably watch it. Yeah. You but, still eat your fruity pebbles though. No, I haven't had a bowl of cereal that wasn't like, Honey Nut Cheerios in probably like five years. It's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> but I will eat a Pop-Tart occasionally. But oh, anywho, yeah. talk, <laughs> Pop -Tart. 
T- talking about this, this rye whiskey, like I, I just want people to understand the depth and complexity of this. Um, we were talking about this beforehand. We've talked about rye whiskey on the bourbon lens a variety of different times uh, with a variety of different brands. And this one sticks out to me. You know, Scott, I would love to know your opinion because rye is kind of like a hit or miss thing for you. You really either really like it or you're kind of like, eh. so what yeah. do you think of this kind of different characteristic of, of rye whiskey? Definitely don't go into this thinking that you're going to be drinking a Kentucky style rye whiskey. You know, the absence of, of corn uh, is, is clear. But then that malted grain is just the most unique. If you want to know what malting does to different grains, try this whiskey because this is exactly what that malting does. I know two years ago when I first tried it, I was like, what is this? But that was very early on the podcast, very early on in my exploring other types of whiskey outside of bourbon. And I could barely wrap my head around. I'd have to go back and listen to the episode, but I was probably like, just confused <laughs> but i always i always go back to it like i think we had two bottles come to us back then and one of them has been long gone the other one i've, I've been holding on to just because i like to pour it on occasion and um uh, you know to see it older in a new package and and that it's still that familiar old Prochero. you know some people have asked me what's the most unique whiskey you've tried and there's there's a handful that that are doing things different uh, one of them is Old Prochero. Another one is uh, it's like 291 with their Aspen staves. Now that's that's a wood wood thing versus a grain thing. But Old Prochero, you know, it's happy to see it in new packaging. Happy to see that it's familiar. Uh, but it definitely is a very unique whiskey. One of my favorite things about this, because I, I like rye, um, it gives you a little bit of everything. I think in this one, that malting gives it uh, an extra level of flavor and complexity that you wouldn't get um, elsewhere. Um, and if you're familiar with a scotch or an American single malt, uh, this has a lot of characteristics. So you have that fresh, clean pop kind of, um, you know, fill in your mouth, but it's got a lot of depth to it. So on the nose, you get a little citrus and a lot of, a lot of bitter chocolate. Like if you like that real dark, bitter chocolate, this, this drink is for you. It kind of lends to maybe you would think you were getting like a really dark, stout drink almost like it's got that some of those characteristics if you're into to beer Um, but it drinks like that dark chocolate throughout the palate and it's got that bitterness to it Um, that's just really on putting to me it it, the only thing I can think of it that really rivals this and you know Bruce you you're probably gonna like maybe chuckle at this but uh, a fresh poured Guinness at Guinness like that's a really very particular note, but that's kind of what I get here is like, it's got a little bit of that nitrogen type taste to it. It's, it's got of some dark flavors to it. And it, for me, this is like a, a sit around a campfire whiskey mm-hmm. at its finest because yeah. it's got all those dark notes and it drinks kind of like a stout. So this could be a perfect fall, you know, afternoon, evening, get your campfire going, turn on the the college football game or whatever you, you like or whatever your poison is. And maybe it's murder. She wrote, whoever knows. Um, and, uh, <laughs> get your, get your old Potrero on. Yeah, definitely. Definitely a cool weather whiskey. Yeah. You know, the, the yeah, you brown, know, I th- brown sugar and molasses notes, they just carry through. Yeah. I thought what you said about, um, you know, that, that there, there is, you know, it, it's, it, you know, Potrero has the, the, you know, the rye characteristics, but, there is something in there, you know, that reminds you of of single malt, single barley malt. You know, the 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 malted grain really, you know, has an influence. And the other thing that that I think, and as I do this more as time goes on, that I think is is really important is um, the yeast we use, and we don't use a distiller's yeast. Um, we use a a brewer's ale yeast mm. and um and we've we've done like some experiments with other yeast and we we really feel like you know some of the vital character that makes old potrero potrero comes from that that brewer's yeast um you know i really like it and i think you know kind of that roundness and depth is is yeast related yeah you know what's really interesting we we had a really good conversation with miles from uh westward uh, whiskey and they use, um, a brewer's yeast as well. Uh, and 
you know, all, all those people up in the North, uh, using, using all the, the beer references, but they have, they had that stout. Uh, and I think that's what I'm getting is that, that it's got a beer kind of feel to it because of that yeast, right? Like that, that's showing up. So that makes a whole lot of sense. And like thinking back to the conversation with another brand who uses, you know, a, a brewer's yeast is, is a lot different, um, to me. And I just love the way this coats the palate. Like it's not harsh. It doesn't burn at 97 proof. It's super approachable and it hits all like your sensory palates, um, part of your palates, which not every whiskey does. Some of it just hits the tip of your tongue and like, that's it. Or just like burns your chest and you can't even taste the flavor profiles. This is something that kind of coats over the palate. And I think that's one of the most magical things about this whiskey um, is the fact that it does have a lot of uh, coating effect uh, to your palate. So this yeah. is very interesting. I was paying so much attention to the front of the the redesigned packaging. I didn't even realize that there was tasting notes on the back until just now. And I'm looking at my tasting notes and I'm looking at these tasting notes and this never happens because I think tasting notes on bottles are just generally fluff and whatever. But my, my tasting notes are brown sugar, molasses, dark cherry, uh, dark char- cherry chocolate ice cream and malty. I'm looking at these tasting notes and they say brown sugar, black cherry, spice, and maple. I'm like, well, that's uh, pretty damn close. So I think I, I think I nailed that or, or whoever did the tasting notes. I'm, was it you? <laughs> was it you, Bruce? Oh, hell no. I, I, hate, <laughs> I hate, but it was um, um, Kevin Aslan, who is our like innovation distiller. Um, he stepped up and took one for the team and wrote the, wrote the tasting. Notes. Well, I think, yeah. So I'll tell him that, um, <laughs> that you, you agree with him. Very, very rarely happens. They're like, yeah, it tastes <laughs> like, uh, fresh flowers and rose petals. And you're like, what the hell? What is that? <laughs> yeah. I, I, when they said they needed ta- tasting notes, I, you know, I kind of moved to the back of the classroom, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, is it good? Is it not good? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. it thumbs up, middle, down? I, I'm, I'm with you. Um, <laughs> if, it, if it doesn't relate to food, it's really hard for me to give you a tasting note. Um, so if it like, and unless I, I think my, oh, wow. Unless it relates to food, I'm not really good at tasting notes unless I had one really weird whiskey that I opened. Scott will know this. And I said it smelled like a Toyota motor manufacturer. And <laughs> And I yeah. honest to God said that. And, and my buddy, uh, Michael, who, who's on the podcast too, right? He, he said the same thing. We worked together at the time servicing that client and it just smelled like a manufacturing shop. Um, but that's the weirdest tasting note I've ever had in my life. Uh, but it, again, it's personal to me. Not many people would understand that. Uh, but you know, <laughs> and it wasn't a positive experience. Right? No, it was, it was a very unpositive experience, but I will tell you two years later, that bottle of whiskey is phenomenal. It's crazy. Really? What, what, yeah. Um, aeration is a very interesting thing. Uh, people don't believe yeah. it in whiskey, but I, I a hundred percent do. You know, I had a bottle of, um, someone gave me this in the mid nineties, a bottle of, um, McAllen 25 year old, and it was distilled in like 1969 or something. And I, I drank it, but I saved, you know, probably about two ounces and, um, I don't know, about six months ago, I got it out and tried it and I couldn't believe how good it was. It was, it was, I don't know, probably the, the, it it just floored me how, how rich and how beautiful it was. And, you know, and, and, you know, people always say, well, you know, you can't just store whiskey in an open bottle indefinitely. And I don't know. Bourbon consumers would would, uh, okay for this one. Bourbon consumers would uh, disagree because they buy like old dusty bottles that have been opened from like the 1970s for thousands and thousands <laughs> of dollars. <laughs> oh man, no, but I, they don't have lead in them. Yeah, mm, true. Hopefully not. Yeah. Don't just don't drink out of the decanters. That's just yeah. like, just don't do it. So one of the things that you all have done, you know, kind of coming out of this repackaging, is also go after go back after the single barrel market, right? And and dive into that. And one of the samples that you were lucky and we were lucky enough to get uh, is a single barrel of Opa Trail. So, you know, when you when you think about this as a distiller, right? Um, getting a pure expression, right? For for a blend, 
uh, that you're putting in that six year, you're going after a profile. What do you expect from a single barrel? Like what's like, how big does the range really get from, from your perspective from a distiller when you're, you're kind of looking at what may go into these single barrel programs? You know, at, as, as we talked about, of course, you know, we get barrel variation, but you know, as we were talking about before that our, our barrels are all kind of subjected to, to the same, um, um, temperature and humidity conditions. Um, I don't think we get as much variation as, as other places might get. Um, you know, you know, we definitely do get some and, and, um, you know, you, you, you'll find, uh, you know, in, in the whole thing with selecting single barrels that people are drawn to, to certain barrels when, you know, certain aspects are, are highlighted. And, and, you know, as you're talking about, um, you know, tasting old Petro before, like some people really like, um, you know, the, the kind of bold cinnamon, um, and, and some people like, you know, a little, the, a little depth and a little rounder and, you know, some of the, you know, the baking spices and that kind of thing. But in my mind, I don't think that, that we get, um, you know, just a, a, a huge range. Yeah. You say that. And then Scott, we picked the single barrel up and we were like, man, that that's a lot different, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got one that's, that's a lot different. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, and, and it I, it does happen, you know. I won't I won't say say it isn't. You know, it's it's amazing with, um, you know, barrel variation. You know, not only you know flavor, like sometimes the color. You know, you'll look at, you know, the whiskey coming out of one barrel and how it picks up a lot more color than you know another barrel. So. Yeah. So speaking of that, what type of barrel and, and char are you all using, if you can say? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you you know we're we're really pretty proud of, of, um, you know, our, our barrels and, and how we arrived on, on our barrels. Um, you know, when we started, you know, we, we got licensed at the beginning of 93 and, um, um, you know, we didn't start putting whiskey into barrels for about a year or so because we were brewers. Um, and, um, you know, we we're trying to teach ourselves how to, how to distill. And, um, but, but once we thought we were getting new spirit, um, you know, that, that it was good enough to put into barrel, we, we contacted at Cooperages and we, um, ended up using independent stave company and they, they were just so good to us and so, um, easy to work with. And, and Fritz Maytag, the owner of Anchor, um, he had background in the wine industry and, you know, the standard bourbon barrel at that time was just coarse grain, kiln dried, um, 53 gallon barrel, um, just, you know, set on fire, charred. And, and that was it. And it was, it was really the cheapest barrel you could get. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, most of the whiskeys coming out then didn't really support, um, you know, uh, they didn't have a price that supported uh, an expensive barrel, but, um, you know, in talking to him, we wanted to experiment with different types of wood. Um, and every time we made barrels, um, I would go to, to Lebanon, Missouri, and we would try different stuff. And, but it was all kind of centered around, um, air dried, um, fine and extra fine grain, um, American Oak. And, um, so what independent stave started doing for us was, um, building the, the barrels on their wine line, but doing 53 gallon barrels. And so our standard barrel now that we use is 24 month air dried, extra fine grain. And then it goes through a full toasting, um, uh, regimen before it's charred. And so all that toasting and charring is just done over a, a like an oak fire by hand. And, um, we, we think, um, we think it's an important part of, of, you know, our whiskey. Yeah. I think it's, it's really important. A lot of people don't know like the depth and complexity that goes into selecting that barrel, right? Because it does have a a important impact on the whiskey. Uh, I think so many times we think it's the distillate or the, 
the weather and, and all of those things, but you know, char toast, um, how seasoned is the wood, um, is, is a yeah. big difference. And we learned a lot about that from just like going and talking to Kelvin Cooperage and some folks. And so Cooperages are, are very, you know, meticulous in what they're doing. So I'm glad you found a great partner in ISC, um, because they are, they're doing a lot of great things and a lot of people are trusting ISC with their, their barrel production right now. So I'm glad that you all found a partner in that. Yeah, they've been, they've been a great partner to us. And, and, you know, I, you know, I guess the benefit they got out of all the, all the fooling around and experimenting that we did, um, over the years is they do like, um, um, I think it's called Cooper select or barrel now that, that that's an air dried, um, um, toasted and then charred barrel. So they kind of developed a, a product out of, you know, all this experimenting that went on then. And, but they, they were great to work with, you know, that, um, you know, our first order was six barrels. You know? So it's like, I think they, they were, um, they were forward thinking. They thought, they thought, well, this might turn into something because certainly they weren't getting rich off us then, you know? Well, 1996 is a lot different for whiskey category than it is in 2022. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so, so speaking of the single barrel, Scott, you know, just going back to you, you know, you you said something to me like, and I hadn't tried either of uh, the single barrel yet. You were like, man, these two are things are completely different. Um, this will be my my one thing I'll say first before I turn it over to you is I think the single barrel drinks a lot more like the four and a half that we drank previously than the six year does today that's just, it's got more cinnamon. It's a little, uh, more fiery, like red hot type notes. Um, and that maltiness is definitely still there, but like, it's more of those cinnamon nutmeg baking spice. Mm -hmm. I, I called it like, uh, your pumpkin pie, your Thanksgiving meal type of, of whiskey. What's your thoughts on, on this one? Yeah. I mean, one of the characteristics is that it's much higher proof. I mean, yeah, so that's 100%. one thing that I had to get get over. Uh, it's it's almost is it thirty proof points higher. Yeah, but this one drinks more like a rye whiskey that you are likely very familiar with. You know, it drinks less like that old Prochero, um multi unique style, and drinks very. It's very rye forward. It tastes my my tasting notes are rye. It's a rye bomb and cinnamon. Like those are the two things that jumped out at me. And I had to like, I had to kind of sit back and say, are these, should these be more similar? But again, it's a single barrel. That's, that's the nature of the beast, right? Yeah. I think what's interesting about single barrels are people are going to pick the things that are best and, and someone's going to really love this because it's a cinnamon red hot, uh, multi flavor goodness for me though. Like, I love the tameness of the six year because it, it's blended to a really nice specification that fits my profile really well. Like we've said this a million times on the podcast and people are probably going to bash us over the head with a metal chair because they just got watched, got done watching uh, Ric Flair's last match or something the other night, you know, it's 73 years old, you know, the, the 95 to 110, like that's our sweet spot. Like going into that almost 130 category is not something that we're drinking on a daily basis. Do we like a drink it there every now and again? Yeah. But like that six year, just with the dark, bitter, dark chocolate notes, but I'm, I'm all for it. But the single barrel is great. It's an experience. It'll warm your body up. <laughs> <laughs> to make you turn red. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I realized I didn't have any water and I'm like, kind of like uh, zapped my, my palate a little bit on that one, but it, it's really good, but it reminds me of the the four and a half year old that was a little more youthful is what I would say because it's got those like strong characteristics. I think the six year is more uh, mature. It's reserved. It's got more full flavored and body. Uh, the the youthfulness shows up in the single barrel. Yeah, those characteristics that come with you know aging whiskey. Yes, yeah. it's the six year. I I agree. It's I it's incredible. I. I I really enjoy it. I enjoyed the old Pichero of old two years ago. And uh, to see it, you know, six years old, age stated, uh, with potential for, you know, always a little bit older whiskey could be in a bottle. 
Um, but yeah, it's definitely got some great older whiskey characteristics that I think are, are worth exploring. So I've never asked this question before, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So like we're over here fangirling a little bit, Bruce, like what's it like for you who has been producing and been on this journey for 28 years, right? Or almost 30 years. Like what's it like to hear people, you know, praise your whiskey that you're creating? It's, it's exciting for us. I mean, um, being there at the beginning of it, um, you, you have such a connection with, you know, like with the brand and, and, um, you, you know, you're attached to it and, and proud of it. And so, uh, you know, I mean, we love it. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, that's why this whole re-release, uh, repackaging and kind of relaunch of Bull Petrero, um, is, is exciting for us because, um, you know, there's so much new stuff coming out in the whiskey world and so much going on that, you know, it, it, it it's like, um, old Petrero is being noticed again. And I think, um, you know, to me, like the six-year-old really presents old Petrero in a good light in its best light. And so, um, you know, so it's an exciting time and it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to see it. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm really excited to go pick up another bottle of this because this is something that I want me personally, I think would be great on a shelf. Um, but also I think it'd be really cool, uh, in certain type of cocktails too, because of that chocolate bitter note, um, uh, like a, like a darker type of old fashioned. I don't like Manhattans. It'd be perfect with some vermouth. I can already tell you that it would be good with vermouth. But I mean, like, I, I think this is something that I just want to pour personally um, that gets into my rotation of, of whiskeys. And I don't say that lightly um, because I have a lot of different whiskeys that we get to try and, and I pick up, you know, from time to time. Like, I'm really excited about this because football season's right on the corner. I'll be in Lexington quite a few Saturdays out of the year. And this would be a great uh, whiskey for, for a game prior to, to going in doing some tailgating. So I I'm, I'm excited to go pick up a bottle of this in the re-release, but now that I've fangirled for the last five minutes, one of the things we did talk about, you know, in our last episode, cause I distinctly remember this was like, what was going to happen with, you know, American single malt and the TTB has now come out with something. And, uh, it, it's really interesting to me because you all are single malt grain, but America has kind of you know, kind of followed the rules of like, Hey, malted barley. So like, like, what does that mean for you all? As you all think about this re-release, you know, to fit into more of the rye whiskey category versus maybe that emerging channel. Well, that was American single malt originally thought maybe in 2020. Really? Um, I don't, I don't think that it it's really detrimental to us. Um, you know, we can still tell the story that we're a hundred percent malted rye. And, um, you know, I don't know if people found it confusing that on our label, it said single malt and then it says straight rye whiskey. But, you know, I, th I think, you know, we identify the, our, our standard of identity, of course, is straight rye whiskey. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's, you know, because it's, it's a unique mash bill, I think, you know, that we have to kind of, you know, take that on the education of, of consumers about how our straight rye whiskey differs from most straight rye whiskeys. I would, I would have liked to have seen, um, the American single malt category just be single malt grains in general. Um, you know, I, th I think, you know, it might, um, might have led to more innovation. I don't know, possibly, you know, I, I don't know that we need to be locked into, to, you know, kind of mimicking what Scotland does, but yeah, I think, I think, I think we'll be fine with it. So. Well, I think, you know, packaging redesign and packaging period allows you to do some education uh, mm -hmm. for the customer, which, you know, the TTB isn't trying to say, no, you can't put that on a label because generally you can put a lot of crazy stuff <laughs> on, a, on a whiskey label. Um, but, but, you know, I think that 
making it simple, show them what's different, you know, hundred percent pot distilled that, you know, what's pot distilled. Uh, it's very different than column, column still whiskeys, you know, malted grain says right there, hundred percent malted rye. It's, you know, that's your opportunity to do the education in addition to like podcasts like this and, you know, getting the name back out there and putting the bottle out there, uh, on social media. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, that's what I was saying. Like that was the, I was super excited when we, we got, uh, you know, approached by your PR company about, you know, just having you all back on because I remember the, the whiskey being polarizing at the, at the time, right? Because I wasn't necessarily super into whiskey. I was finding my way at that time. Like we were 75 episodes in and to be honest, I hadn't drank a whole lot of whiskey and that one kind of was like, Ooh, welcome, welcome to the show. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it was probably honestly, honest to God, it was probably one of the first whiskeys that was like, Hey, you need to explore other things other than bourbon. Huh? And yeah. we had, we had three podcasts in a row and I don't know how this worked out this way, probably to Scott, but it was Westland, what, uh, Starward and you all like all in a row. And it was like, Oh, there's so much more to bourbon and so much more to whiskey than just corn bourbon. And so for me, it, it really kind of pushed me to expand my limits. Um, and so when, when we got the chance to to have you all back on, I was like, Oh, this would be great. Uh, I didn't know anything about the redesign. Scott's been holding it down for us on social media. I've been taking a little sabbatical. Uh, so I've been kind of whiskey illiterate from a news perspective (laughs) and, uh, you know, I am so pleasantly surprised and, and super excited for consumers to go out and try this because it's a really, really good whiskey. Well, thank you. Yeah, we're we're excited about this too, and you know we'll be um you know getting it out there um slowly. It's not going to be available everywhere right away, but you know we're we're working towards that. Yeah. So, is it already in market today? I guess that's the better question. Yes. Yeah. It hasn't been long, but it is. Yes. Okay. And how many markets are you all? That's a that's a bold question to ask the master distiller, right? <laughs> How many? Yeah, because because he he's not totally sure. <laughs> gotcha. So no, I I knew it was a dumb question as soon as I asked it. Uh, but you all are. I I know you're in Kentucky. Uh, I've seen the the label, but I don't know if it's launched here yet. Uh, but I'm sure it would would be soon to follow if it's not here yeah. in Kentucky yet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I think you know some single barrels are being made available in Kentucky, but um, the regular the six year old um. I, I don't think is in Kentucky yet. Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to tell everybody, just be on the lookout. Um, it's a, it's a really fine whiskey that I think you should, you should be on the lookout for. Uh, if you like rye whiskey, which it's the second largest category, right? Like it's, it's growing and growing and growing and growing. I was looking at units of cases moved of rye whiskey. Like it's not too far. I mean, it's, it's far off from bourbon, but it's not far off. Um, so when you think about this, this is still an emerging category. Give this one a try. Um, that's, that's my recommendation. Scott, I mean, parting shots, anything else from you? No, I, I'm again, just happy to have you back and, and good to see where the brand has gone. Um, and how you guys are continuing to move forward and putting out older products and still doing your thing. I mean, I think that that's admirable and happy to see the re- redesign package and looking forward to seeing it on shelves. Bruce, we, we really appreciate it. You joining us again. You're always fun to chat with. I think I had just as much fun talking to you pre-show as I did during the show <laughs> here today. We used up all our good stuff then, huh? We did. We did. We hit on, we hit on pretty much everything though. Um, so it was a repeat for Bruce, but no, it, it's great having you back. We love repeat guests. And, and again, we're super excited for, for what you all are doing. If you all want to learn more about Hodling & Co., just go to Hodling Co. Uh, you can find out more about all their brands, especially Old Potrero, uh, with their re- redesign and repackaging. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Bourbon Lens, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at Bourbon Lens, uh, or go over to patreon.com backslash Bourbon Lens to get exclusive opportunities to hang out with us. But most importantly, uh, as always, we'd really appreciate any five-star reviews or likes that you would give our way. Uh, it's really important really important and beneficial to us. Um, we, we do this for fun. Um, we love to get your all's feedback. So if you don't mind going to your favorite podcast, listening app and, and smashing that subscribe button and give us a five-star review, that'd be much appreciated. Thanks again, Bruce, for joining us here tonight. 
and everyone else have a great week talk to you soon cheers thank you cheers nice spending time with you guys enjoy yeah, thanks for coming